Hey, money makers! Welcome back to another live edition of Taking Stock. I'm Kalila Reynolds, and we're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. So, of course, I want you to leave a comment below and let us know, you know, where you're joining us from, what part of the country, what part of the world, and just give us all the updates. I see a lot of people are already online. So, up next is what's hot in business, and then we're also going to tell you what's coming up in tonight's show. We've got another good one. And of course, come on, let's get this money. E-commerce and logistics company Mailpack Group is acquiring MyCart Express, the second largest courier company in Jamaica. Mailpack's executive chairman, Carrie Robinson, joins us live to discuss the acquisition and Mailpack's expansion plans. And the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. Massey Holdings just announced huge changes to its senior management. What led to that decision, we'll discuss. Plus, Meta's results for the 2023 financial year are out. How did they perform? But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. VM Investments is ready to go to court with several entities associated with the troubled Accurate Group to recover over half a billion dollars from unpaid loans. According to the lawsuits filed in the Supreme Court, VM Investments issued three loans to parties associated with iCreate between 2022 and 2023. The total outstanding balance on the three loans is $504.5 million. Kintar Holdings, eMedia Interactive Group, AHL, SPV, and businessman Kevin Frith were all named in the suit. VM said the parties were all signatories to the loans and were in breach of the loan agreements after failing to pay the outstanding balances. Thousands of Jamaicans were reportedly fleeced out of millions after investing in the online company Warner Media. The company recruits users to help boost YouTube and TikTok traffic to celebrities and artists. Users are compensated based on the number of tasks they complete and the number of people they can bring into the company. However, many users have reported difficulty receiving their payouts after investing heavily in the platform. Express Catering is looking to raise up to 12 million US dollars through a new bond offer. The bond will be offered at a fixed interest rate of 8.5% and is set to mature in 2027. According to Express Catering, the funds will be used to help refinance existing debt and finance other projects. Express Catering is the sole food and beverage provider at Sanks International Airport. Supreme Ventures said it paid out a record $48 billion to Lotto and Super Lotto winners for 2023. There were five Lotto jackpot winners and three Super Lotto winners last year. All the winning numbers were from Jamaica. On the sports betting side, SVL said 68 each won over a million dollars last year. What's Hot was brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. What do the world's richest people all have in common? I'll give you the top five from the Forbes rich list and let's see if you can figure it out. Number one is Bernard Arnault, founder of LVMH, Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy. Number two, Elon Musk, co-founder of Tesla and SpaceX. Three is Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon. Four, Larry Ellison, co-founder of tech giant Oracle. And number five is Warren Buffett, founder of Berkshire Hathaway. So it should be pretty obvious, right? They all founded or co-founded major companies. They're all entrepreneurs. Jeff Bezos famously founded Amazon out of his garage in 1994. Elon Musk has co-founded six companies, including Tesla. Warren Buffett is perhaps the world's most famous investor, but he also founded the investment firm Berkshire Hathaway. So without a doubt, entrepreneurship is one of the major keys to wealth creation. For the world's richest man, Bernard Arnault, this also means generational wealth. All five of his children work at LVMH. Now, if this is what you envision for yourself, your first step is simply to get started. Bring that business idea to reality with Business Startup Basics. In this Money Mission webinar, corporate attorney and business accelerator Chantal Simpson tells you everything you need to know to set up your business legally. Now, you already missed the live, but the replay is now available. The link is in the description. Let's get this money.
Welcome back. Let's shout out to our viewers. We have Raquel says, let's get this money. Kemoy, uh, Raquel again, reminding you guys to like and share the video comments. Demar says, good night from Kingston. Finessing says, good evening. He's in Montego Bay. We have Roger all the way in Philly. We have Antoinette in Arizona. We have Dwight in the house. We have another Dwight from Spanish, no, same Dwight from Spanish Town. We have Jermaine healing all the way from China. Jermaine in Montego Bay, humble, humble boss in the grill. And of course, Nano stands from far, far away. So let me know in the comments, in the chat, where you're joining us from this evening. We have another awesome show. E-commerce and logistics solutions company, Mailpack Group, will be acquiring MyCart Express. That's the fastest growing and second largest courier company in Jamaica. Joining me now to discuss all about their acquisition and expansion plans, we have Mailpack's Executive Chairman, Carrie Robinson. Hi, Carrie, it's been a while. It has been, Khalila, it has been. How have you been? I have been pretty good. The last time we had you on was 2019 when we just, just started this show. I just saw you for that. You were, you were carrying. I was, and my son just celebrated his fourth birthday. So here Time we are. Flies fast. Time flies fast. It's four years later, and it's because you have a big announcement to make. You have some news for us. We already kind of broke it already, but just give us the update because it just it's just bust today. For sure. Um, so I mean, obviously, we'll go into a lot of it, but today we announced the we signed a definitive agreement to acquire MyCart Express. Um, which is, you know, the fastest growing courier company in Jamaica today um, and the second largest. Uh, so we're excited about that for, for many reasons um, from, a, from a group standpoint. And what is this going to mean for the company, for Mailpack? So, you know, when we got involved in Mailpack uh, in 2008, the, there was about, I don't know, maybe 10% of homes in Jamaica or less um, shopped online. So it was mostly people with high disposable income um, with credit cards and it was a nascent business. And so our focus was to focus on those, you know, um, higher end customers with a high level of service, high level, high level touch. Um, and everything around our business was built for that. Over that time period, the business has expanded. Uh, I think we had maybe three competitors at, at that point. Huh. Today we have over 120. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have to, I would venture to say at least 70% of households in Jamaica are doing some level of online shopping. And so you've seen where there's a segmentation based on price and service in the marketplace. And for a long time, Mailpack then was stuck in trying to serve a number of segments from one platform. We were, you know, for, for lack of better terms, trying to be everything to everybody. And that's never a good model for a business, right? So you need, you need to stick to your core differentiators and be able to focus on your core segment. So we decided that we were going to create a second segment that focused on that core price conscious segment of the market with a product called Swoop. Um, we developed it. And the reason why we developed this is because we could never find a business that we could acquire that felt like it fit our model, right? Which is um, a much more scalable model and less of a mom and pop operator, which is what you find out there a lot in, uh, in the marketplace today. And then coincidentally, our marketing agency introduced me to uh, so two founders of MyCart. Um, and, uh, you know, after that first meeting, I think both sides realized and recognized that there's a lot, you know, of, um, that could be created by build, bringing together all the resources and relationships and insights um, these guys are, you know, young, aggressive, innovative, um, have done an exceptional job in building my cart into what it is today. And we're, we're just happy to, you know, now put those businesses together and be a part of that journey. Um, I, I do want to clarify, though, when I say put those businesses together, my, my Park will continue to be a separate brand for my cart and they will operate independently. They'll focus on their core customers. They'll focus on their core differentiators. So very different businesses within or under the group portfolio. Um, but it will allow us to segment and, and target our customers in a way that we always wanted to um, and support, you know, Aldein and, and Kamar in really taking my cart to that next level, as well as them supporting us in taking the group to a much broader scale. But you are looking to rebrand Mailpack to MyPack. So, yeah. so, so, so how does that work if they're still two different companies? Right. So the group, which is the holding company, think about the group as the holding company, 
was called Mailpack Group because it only had one brand under it, right? It was Mailpack. Now the group will have two separate brands with two separate identities. One will be Mailpack and one will be My, My Cart. But just so that we ensure we don't confuse the market because it's two very different products and two very different um, positioning across those products, the group itself will change its name to My Park, to My Park. The group changes its name. Ah, Correct. all right. So, so if I want to- The group is not an operating entity. The group is a holding company. Um, that's a publicly listed holding company. And that mm. holding company, which will be, you know, once the, the shareholders approve at the e EGM, that holding company called MyPack will own two brands. One will be MailPack, and MailPack will continue to serve its customers. And one will be MyCart, and that company will continue to serve its customers. I see. I see. So this is a change that really only affects shareholders and Correct. only affects on a, you know, generic level anyway, because it's just a change in name. But when you go into your account, you're going to see my pack shares instead of meal pack shares. Correct. Correct. I see. So if I'm a my cart customer, nothing changes. I still go mm -hmm. to the same website to place my orders. Absolutely. So one of the things that was important to us is that both companies both brands remain distinct in their identities they are they serve very different customers in very different ways with very different pricing um very different locations and so at no point did we want to commingle that because then you lose the value of being able to target different segments of the market um with the two different brands so they will continue to be independent brands um that that have their true identities and that people love. I mean, the, the, the my cart customers love my cart for what they provide, and Mailpack customers love what they get from Mailpack, and they'll continue to get that service from both sides. Okay, so Mailpack continues to focus on, I guess you would say, the higher end of the market, and then my cart is for the budget conscious uh, persons. For lack of more detail, yes, I would say yes. Um, you know, my card is definitely a value focused brand, a value focused platform. Um, but that doesn't mean that innovation and service is not, you know, superior or premier uh, there because, you know, one of the things that Aldane and Kamar, who you should meet at some point, I mean, all, awesome entrepreneurs and they're going to become a part of our team, um, they built their own Miami warehouse platform and their own software that I think is market leading. Um, and so it is, you know, it is built around the customers that they wanted to target. They understand that customer segment. And the truth is that customer segment is much broader than the customer segment that Mailpack serves. And then Mailpack now, who, you know, really spent 10, 15 years building a core um, customer segment but then was trying to trickle in a different segment because of where the market grew into, can now refocus on its core customers and give them a level of service and experience that those customers want. I have a question from YouTube from one of our viewers. Andre Brown says, with Amazon delivering locally in Jamaica, what will be Mailpack and my cart strategy to fend off this competition? And not just Amazon, but you said there are 120 competitors now. Yeah, I um I was hoping you'd ask me this because I saw your video on the Amazon threat. Uh, the the reality is that Amazon has always had a, pla a, a ability to deliver directly to, to customers in Jamaica. They you do it through um, a couple different providers like uh, DHL. Um, but what you get as a courier customer will never be able to be um, granted or or provided from Amazon because the courier platform is tailored for that last mile from Miami to Jamaica. So the way that we um, service our customers and provide a, a address, the speed at which we deliver to Jamaica, the fact that we clear th on a consolidated basis, which is a lot cheaper than consult um, clearing on an individual basis, the information that you have to provide um, to, to DHL or whoever the provider is versus what you do on our platforms and how that's done. It's a much more seamless, much more cost efficient model. In fact, Amazon is, is looking to partner with um, entities that we you know, know quite well, I can't talk out of, of turn, but know quite well to try and create a little bit more seamlessness around that process. But you know, it is, it's not, the Amazon piece for us is not a compet competitor today. Um, they'll never be able to have the service that we have and the price that we have. 
what, what where we do see competition is in the broader market. As I said, 120 competitors. Uh, my lifestyle. Freezing up. Uh, is it me or is it him freezing up? I think he is freezing up. But I remember something that he's that Carrie said to me way back in 2019 when they were just doing the IPO. Hopefully, you're back. I am back. Right, good. I, sorry. Yeah, you, you froze just now. Uh, you were in the middle of saying that Amazon is not a competition to you. What is a competition is the 120 locally. Correct. Correct. Um, and and the reality is that you know you see this in many markets, right? So you you have a plethora of people that have entered the market um, and. It, it, you start to get less and less differentiation uh, between each of those. But one of the things that we are excited about with now having Mailpack and, and MyCard is that we have the platform to target both types of customers and really push out you know, a lot more locations, a lot more services, a lot more technology um, that will supersede anything that an individual, um, you know, let's, for lack of better terms, mom and pop provider can 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 provide. So I think over the next eighteen months, you will see a lot of those smaller players start to refocus or you know even fall out of the market, and you're going to see brands like MyCart and like Mailpack um, have a lot more locations and serve their customers in a very different way than you know has the, the, the from the genesis of this business coming up. So. We're, we're, we're excited about establishing the number one and number two platforms, um, you know, as, as the industry becomes a little less or a little more commoditized. But I remember speaking about this with you on that episode four years ago when you were doing the IPO, your heavy on acquisition strategy. That's how Mealpack really built up the brand mm -hmm. and, and built up your presence in the market. So now that you have the number two, your biggest competitor, what percentage of the market does the group now control? So it's it's hard to tell that number because the data is not ready. Like everything else in Jamaica, the data is not readily available. Um, what I will say is that this acquisition has doubled our package volume. Um, so we were number one in in the market, um, and and it has doubled our our package volume. So that has done significantly well for us. Um, but it, it is difficult to say what that provides for us in a market, market share basis. What it does for us, though, it gives us the potential for a lot of economies of scale and a lot of operational synergies. So you can imagine, you know, we are we have a team that, for example, processes packages, um, you know, from Miami or, or, or locally, and you now double the volume. You don't need the same amount of um, infrastructure you can, you know, deliver to the different locations, um, you know, purchasing power with our air freight providers. There's a lot of opportunities that we're seeing. We haven't done or made any changes. And on the front end, we don't plan to change the platforms at all. As I said, it's important that they retain their identity. But in the background, between the two companies, you have about $800 million of admin expenses, you know, things that we spend to run the business, the core of the business. Um, that we should be able to rationalize and, and get some savings from um, to create greater shareholder value. Mm, all right. That's the money talking. So you're expecting revenues to go from what currently to what? Um, I, I always get myself in trouble when I answer these questions because I'm, I'm not always sure what I am allowed to say and not allowed to say. So I'll stick to the, the line that this doubles our volume. Obviously, you know, uh, my card pricing is different from from that of, of mail pack uh but this does do double our package volume well we have a lot of questions online so let me take some more of them jerome wants to know will the doubling of volume and future growth lead to a consideration of purchasing or leasing a plane so i think it's every courier's dream um to be completely independent one of the things that uh my cart and alain and kamar have done is create a level of independence in at Miami and not from a software perspective. And so, you know, the only thing that we are left um, to, to get third party support on is our air freight. Uh, so it, it is, you know, it, it goes without saying that we will have to take a hard look at that um, with, with the level of volume that we have. Um, can't make any promises, but, you know, independence as a business is always something that we uh, try and, and, and endeavor to have. 
So that's a maybe. That's a maybe. That's, that's, a, maybe. that's a you want to. You want to. You're gonna see. You're gonna see how the money look. Next question <laughs> come from. <laughs> next question comes from Learn Grow Invest. Uh, speaking of acquisitions, does this leave room for other brands to come under my pack? Any additional acquisitions planned? Yeah, I am. Um, so it, it would be impossible for me to sit here and honestly say that acquisitions are never on the forefront of any business that Norbrook is involved in. So I think, you know, you guys can just assume that whatever we're involved in, we grow on two engines. I've said this a million times. We grow on two engines. One is organic growth. You know, um, how do we enhance revenues? How do we cut costs? But the other is obviously growing through acquisition. That said, I don't know if there, if we will be looking aggressively at anything locally. I think that my card and Mailpack give us the breath in two market, the two core markets that we want to, to go into. But that doesn't mean we does we don't have regional um, aspirations. Mm. I think that you know ourselves at at at, at Mailpack and now with Alden and Kamar um, joining the team, you know there there is a distinct desire to take what we've developed, um, not just in Jamaica, but outside of Jamaica. Um, at, Norbrook has done that a couple of times uh, with a couple of other businesses. And we think that we have the breadth of, of resources today you now to really look aggressively at expanding outside of the shores of Jamaica. Which markets are you looking at first? I The obvious ones. <laughs> <laughs> Trinidad? Scale, scale matters for us, right? Scale matters. So uh, um, we have a business in the Dominican Republic. It's the largest market in the Caribbean. Uh, we've done well there. And so obviously we will be looking there. Uh, Trinidad is a market that we have always had an eye on um, and, you know, have endeavored to, to step into. And, and then what we've done recently is we've, you know, planted our flag in Central America. Uh, which is really Costa Rica and Panama are, are those two core markets there. And so, you know, we, we believe that if we are we are successful at getting an acquisition, it would come from one of those four countries, if not all. Good stuff. Next question comes from Jerome. Jerome, and I like that you're not limiting yourself to the English-speaking countries because Latin America, huge. So Jerome wants to know, will this acquisition require a need to go over the share capital limit of the junior market? That's a great question. Um, you know, having the tax benefit of the junior market was important for us. It's probably, you know, 90% of the reason why we listed Mailpack in the first place, just to make sure that we were being capital efficient and return efficient. And so anything we do, we would endeavor to ensure that we don't lose that benefit. So we have a couple unique structures that we've developed um, that we you know, can't expose today because it's it's our, our proprietary um, way of creating value while maintaining uh, our our tax status. But no, the the short answer is that we would not anticipate and don't um, don't anticipate any change in the tax status and any increase over the five hundred million dollar um, capital limit. So staying on the junior market, JBT is asking. The money question. What was the value of the transaction? So the, the beauty of this transaction is that it's a contingent payment uh, based on the performance of my cart in 2024. Uh, we structured the transaction that way because it was important for us to ensure that in all scenarios, as, as my cart grows and my cart has been growing very rapidly, uh, that this transaction is accretive to our existing shareholders. And so because it's a contingent payment, I can't tell you what the value is until the end of 2024, but shareholders can rest assured that regardless of whatever the outcome um, in 2024 for, for my card, that the transaction itself is going to be accretive for their, for their shareholding. And we'll see it on your financial statements when it comes out anyway. Well, you'll see, you won't see the closing. So the, the transaction closes in 12 months or thereafter, after we get the 2024 results, live results um, or audited results. And that's when the, the formula that we have for the contingent payment kicks in. But what you will see is this transaction is expected to close in about 30 days. And the results of my card as a part of Mailpack Group or MyPack, you know, when, when, when the name changes, um, you'll see that hit our numbers immediately after that. 
So I think that by Q2, you'll see the full effect of the business for a quarter. Um, and even in Q1, you probably see about a month, month and a half of, of the impact of my card. Your Q2 is when? When, when is your... Uh, so we are, we are December. So our Q2 will end June. Okay. Next question comes from Michael. I know you had a meeting yesterday to consider dividends and the viewers are all over it. Michael wants to know if you're paying out dividends this year. So Michael should know that uh, we pride ourselves on having the highest dividend yield in the stock market. Um, and we continue and consistently pay out dividends. Um, and so this year we expect that to be no different. Um, so, you know, we, we had our consideration. I can't speak on that consideration, obviously, uh, but history, history has shown that Mailpack has been a strong cash flow earner and has been a strong dividend producer for its shareholders. Remind us what the dividend policy is. Pay, pay, pay. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. We shareholders love to hear that. Lanestra, one of our viewers, has an interesting suggestion. Uh, I think Mailpack should further diversify the business and buy out one of those food delivery businesses. It's looking at that type of diversification, Karen? So um, we've looked at a diversification across the e-commerce. You know, when we look at our mission statement, our, our, our mission statement doesn't speak to um, just online shopping. It speaks to e-commerce and, and, and being a conduit between um, consumers and all e-commerce um, provider pl platforms. So, you know, we launched a platform called Packy Barrel, which allows you to pack barrels digitally. We launched Mailpack Local, which allows you to buy groceries um, locally online. Um, we have our, our MyCart brand and, and Mailpack as well. And so we will obviously continue to find ways to use a digital platform or e-commerce to bring convenience savings and choices to to consumers um, wherever we serve them and food is obviously one of those so it's not lost on us the opportunity in food delivery um, and in securing or acquiring food through a digital platform uh, but you know can't say what our our plans or the timing around that will be mm, interesting you know this is exciting news especially for shareholders and re remembering where you're coming from uh, from 2008 up until now you mentioned pack your barrel just now pyb mm -hmm. tell us how give us an update on how that's been going since uh, so, we launched so, in 2022 yes we launched in 2022 pack your barrel is growing steadily you know um i i i think about the founders of of mail pack uh who you know always, always tell a story that they used to sit in people's offices just to tell them about Mailpack and convince them that online shopping was, you know, something that could be done. Um, and when they sold us the business in 2008, you know, they would never have dreamt that today Mailpack is where it is and the market is where it is. Um, very similarly, packing your barrel on online feels to be in that nascent stage. So what, what is important to us and what the team always hears me say is that we need to be better today than we were yesterday. So we need to see consistent growth, consistent engagement. We have some very cool programs. We've engaged some schools uh, to try and tap into the diaspora um, with these diaspora slash affinity programs. Um, but you know, the concept of packing a barrel has culturally been, you take a barrel, you go to your house, you go to Target, you go to Walmart, you pack it up, you go to the, 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 the shipper, you ship it off. Somebody then goes to the wharf and clears it and this, this process that is very engaging and um, you know and 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 but takes a lot of effort, and what we are doing is digitizing that so that you can sit at home, pick a barrel, pack shop stuff goes in your barrel, it goes digitally um, on the ship, it goes to Jamaica and and it's delivered directly to the home. But changing that mindset, changing that culture is not going to happen overnight. So again, we appreciate that this is a long tail business, and we have to continue to commit to it and keep getting people awareness and exposure to it. Uh, but we're, we're really excited about it and, and the progress we've made so, so far. What about the reverse? You think it's time for barrels to go from Jamaica to diaspora markets? Because they have heavy demand for local products too. You know, that, that, that's something that um, for years have, we've talked about. And there's been some companies that have, that have you know, stepped into that space. Um, but again, you know, for us, Khalil, it's, it's important that we focus on 
our, our core, but also on the areas where we see scalability and then build out from there. So I, I do think that, you know, similar to Amazon, right? Amazon won't be coming to the Caribbean and building a warehouse anytime soon because they have China to go and do that in and India and Brazil and, and so on. Um, for the same way for us, we want to make sure that we have a footprint in all of those countries that I just, just, just told you about. And once we have a footprint there, we have a relationship with those customers, you know, between my cart and Mailpack, we, have, we will have over 100,000 touch points, people that we talk to and serve on a, on a regular basis. At that point, we can then start to say, okay, how do we create more value for these people or the people that they relate to, um, whether they are a, a, you know, a, a food producer and they want to ship abroad and so on. But we have to get our footprint in there um, in, a, in a strong way. And so that's really our focus now. Mm. By the way, how are shipping prices now? Because I remember during COVID, that just went crazy. Shipping prices are back to normal now? Shipping prices are back to normal. I mean, we don't, you know, do, other than the barrel business, we don't do much sea freight, which is where you saw the big rise um, during COVID. Air freight, um, you know, stayed pretty steady. What we have seen in this industry, um, intriguingly, because you have so many people that have entered it, is that pricing hasn't moved in about seven years in this industry. And we know what has happened to cost in this industry over the last seven years. Air freight has gone up, labor has gone up, um, you know, fuel has gone up and so on. Um, and so, you know, there, there is this dynamic and this happens in many industries that we expect again, that there is going to be a fallout of some of those, you know, more mom and pop um, providers and more established players that can leverage their scale and scope um, to expand their margins, you know, will will end up remaining, and then you'll see some settling of of pricing. But um, but no, the this the air freight pricing really hasn't changed on on either side. But your pricing for mail pack and my cart, both of those will stay the same for existing Correct. customers. Correct. I want to make sure that is is very clear that you know it's business as usual for mail pack and it's business as usual for my cart. Both brands are extremely successful. Both brands serve their customers very well and both brands are very different and it's it's you know it's interesting that you get to have that dynamic and, and we're so excited about that because a lot of times you are good in a market and the market shifts and and so you no longer have relevance so you can't serve the customers in the right way and that's where mailpack was oh, i would say over the last 18 to 24 months we were trying to catch our feet and say well, you know who are we you know we, we know who we were 10 years ago but no, this huge market over here has been created. So do we try to go over there? Do we try to be everything to everybody? And with this um, acquisition, no, we don't have to worry about that because, and my cart, same way, right? My cart was saying, okay, how do I get some of Mailpack's customers? And so they were trying to be over here while still focusing on their core over here. Now both brands get to, to cement themselves as the leading provider in their distinct market segments. Um, and that should just unlock a ton of value for the, the teams, the operations, as well as for the shareholders. Big news. Uh, all right. I wanted to take this question from IG, but I don't know how to put it on the screen. But it comes from Unruly NASA, who wants to know what's the price range to ship a barrel through Pack Your Barrel? That's a good question. Oh, and, there it is. and so if you go to packyourbarrel.com, I'm sure it's all there. Um, we have four barrel types, four barrel sizes, um, and it, it, you know, the pricing of 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 each barrel is is there. But you, I know you pay for your barrel first, then you pay for the service of having the barrel packed and delivered to you. But it's all there on on packybarrel.com. All right, so just go to the website viewer and you know find it all packybarrel.com. Uh, next question, and, final and, and question. Use a, use a discount code. Kalila Reynolds, I'm sure it will work. <laughs> okay, you bet. You better not tell people that, and there's no discount, you know. <laughs> you're telling them that you better I create that discount code right have now. To, so have to put it in right now. I hope the team is listening. Yeah, people, people are gonna try using it. Make All sure right. you spell my name correctly too. So <laughs> the last time you were on the program, because Norbrook has several other co companies under your portfolio, as you mentioned earlier on in the interview as well. The last time you were here. On, <laughs> they put it on the screen. It's this cockroach. <laughs> it better I work. <laughs> Get him a few minutes, guys. I know. Uh, yeah, the last time you were here, we were talking about the potential 
possibility of IPO for other companies, Devon wants to know, when can we expect Express Fitness to list? That was mm -hmm. high on the agenda at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if I'm being honest, I would say that 2024, I would not be surprised if Express doesn't list in 2024. I mean, so the, the company had looked at a listing in 2019 and, and then COVID came. Mm -hmm. um, we know what that did to the, the fitness business and the, the gym business. But the business was forced to become super efficient, super engaging with its customers. I mean, the culture of the of the company had to, to really become a lot more captive to keep and grow the, um, this, its customer base. And it has paid off tremendously. I mean, it, it's now operating at its highest level level. I, I would say that if I think we're probably about 30 or 40 percent more customers today than we had in 2019 and you know maybe 10 times more profitable um and no exaggeration so um we're excited about where the business is that business is also looking to expand in different modalities um in jamaica so other fitness solutions as well as to expand regionally through acquisition so i would not be surprised if we don't list in 2024 and to take advantage of, of leveraging that capital to really Wait, expand hold on, hold on just clarify you would not be surprised if you don't list or you wouldn't be surprised if you do list so i would expect to list in 2024 okay yeah. much clearer thank you for that clarification <laughs> and well we're gonna leave it there carrie unless you have anything else that you want to tell us before we go no i think um this is you know I, I, I think you know, and Kristen definitely knows that I hardly like to, you know, to, to talk. I don't like you know, being in the public eye, but this was an important step for, for Mailpack Group. I mean, we, if you look at our quarterly reports, we have been talking about expansion through acquisition for a long time. We've been talking about differentiating our platform and adding new solutions. And this acquisition not only solved for both of those, but it's bringing in two great um, founders um, in, in Kamara and Aldein, who I'm sure, again, you'll meet at some point, and a great team at MyCart. Uh, so we're, we're super excited about you know, what the future holds for Mailpack Group. Well, thank you for joining us and congratulations on the acquisition. Thank you so much. We look forward to your upcoming results and seeing what this merger brings for Mailpack, for shareholders, and for customers. Thanks again, Carrie. All right. See you soon. Okay, viewers, it's now time for tonight's poll question. You would have seen the news, and maybe you were part of this as well, with the latest Ponzi scheme in Jamaica. Ponzi scheme, pyramid scheme. Um, oh, gosh. What's it called again? Remember what it's called? I know you guys know in the comments. What's it called? The, the pyramid scheme that was, it's on the tip of my tongue. But yeah, the question is, what do you think needs to be done to prevent another Ponzi scheme from happening in Jamaica? What do you think needs to be done? Where's the comments? You guys not telling me in the comments? What do you think needs to be done to prevent another Ponzi scheme from happening in Jamaica? Warner Media. Warner Media is the name of the Ponzi scheme that recently crashed. And let me tell you, in Money Mission, I wish I could, I could probably bring up the testimonial right now, but in Money Mission, we had the Build Your Budget workshop in January. And one of our attendees recently, she came to Build Your Budget and she was strongly considering investing in Warner Media, very strongly. And she explained exactly how it worked and she was excited about it. And she wanted to use it to replace some of her income that she was losing from a, a income source was she wasn't going to have that income source anymore. So she was going to go all in with Warner Media. And she explained it. And I was like, this sounds like a Ponzi scheme. This sounds very, very high risk. And she was like, no, no, no. One of my friends who I trust is doing it and they're getting money and blah, blah, blah. Right, right, right. And I was like, I don't know about this one. This sounds very scamish. And two weeks later, boom. The whole thing came crashing down. So can't say I didn't warn you, right? And for those of you who didn't come to build your budget, listen, I'm not going to lead you astray. A lot of people want to make quick money, but quick money is not where it's at. I'm not going to give you the quick formula to make money tomorrow, but I'm going to teach you how to build wealth slowly, right? Anyway, the question is, what needs to be done to prevent another Ponzi scheme from happening in Jamaica? 
Here are your options. A, more education around Ponzi schemes. B, harsher penalties for perpetrators. C, you can't prevent them. They will always happen. Or other, leave a comment. So you can let us know in the chat what you think. You can go to the community tab of our YouTube page, or you can also take the poll on the app formerly known as Twitter, now called X. You can take that over there and also leave your comments in the chat or uh, in the in the comments here on YouTube or on Facebook or on Instagram, because we're streaming right now on Instagram as well. So yesterday in the Money Mission community, we had Courtney Johnson, Taxpayer Education Officer at TAJ, speaking or teaching us how to file your taxes. Here's a short clip of that. You're going to click on those words that are hyperlinked at the top there, which says click here to return to your e-services page. This one? Go ahead and click. That's correct. There you go. Now, this is the page that you want to start. And once you're at this page, then the next thing you're going to be asked is, do you have an account? So for those persons who have an account, you simply sign into your account by adding your username. So let's say your username is, uh, I don't think I use my username, bless for real. So, you, so I already have an account. So for those who already have an account, you could simply sign in using your username that you have created and the password that was sent to you, that default password that was sent to you on signing up by TAJ or the one that you have since edited and created for yourself. So you already have an account, that's what you do. And then you simply click the sign in button. Voila, you're signed in. Now, what about those who don't yet have an account. What do you do? You'll still be on this page. You'll follow step one and step two. But on this occasion, you will click on, it's right there down below. There you go, create account. Awesome. And so once you click on create account, it's similar. Yeah, so not the best clip from last night. That was just showing you how to create your account. But he actually showed us step by step how to fill out the, the forms, how to do your returns, which forms to click on, how to do it. And he also showed us something really interesting, which was all the deductions. So if you have a small business, you can get tax credits for a bunch of stuff. If you have employees, you get a tax credit, and this reduces your tax liability, meaning the amount of money that you have to pay in taxes, but you have to know them. So if you have employees, you get a tax deduction. If you use your personal vehicle, you get a tax deduction times two. If you have, there's several of them, and he listed them out for us in that webinar. So just go to moneymissionja.com, sign up and create your account, and check out that replay. It is available now inside the community. All right, remember to hit the like button, everyone. Up next, we've got your market recap and the analysts are standing by. Hey, moneymakers, join the KRM fam with our official merch. Get it now at KhalilaReynolds.com. Let's get this money. The JSC Combined Index gained almost 6,000 points last week, or 2%. 123 stocks traded across the main and junior markets for the week ending Friday, February 9, 2024. 68 made gains, 43 lost value, and 12 stayed the same. 107 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, valued at $391 million. Wigton was last week's most traded stock. It took up 16% of market volume with 17 million shares trading. The stock gained one cent open the new week at 94 cents. JMMB 9.5% traded at the second highest. The stock's price remained unchanged at a dollar and three cents. And dollar rounded out last week's most traded with 11 million shares changing hands. The stock gained 36 cents to open Monday at two dollars and 98 cents. Now let's see who had the biggest gains for the week. Sterling Investments USD was the market's biggest gainer. 
The stock was up 33% to open Monday at two cents US. The lab was up 19% to start the new week at a dollar 69 cents. And stationery and office supplies was the week's third biggest gainer. It was up almost 17% to open the new week at one dollar and 89 cents. On the losing side now, Salada Foods was the week's biggest loser. The stock lost 71 cents to open Monday at three dollars 11 cents. T-Tech was the week's second biggest loser opening the new week at $2.06. And Margaritaville Turks lost 15% to close the week at $14.86. Over on the Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, the Composite Index lost 12 points last week. National Enterprises was the most traded stock. The stock's price remained unchanged at $3.75 TT. JMMB was the biggest gain of the week. The stock was up 12% to start the week at $1.45 TT. And on the losing side, NCBFG fell 13% to open Monday at $2.90 TT. Over in the US, the Dow Jones was mostly flat last week, while the S&P 500 was up 1% and the Nasdaq up by 4%. Motorists got a win at the pumps last week, with gas prices falling $3.06 and diesel prices losing $0.02. Cents. In foreign exchange, it took an average one hundred and fifty seven dollars fifty one cents Jamaican to purchase one u s dollar last Friday. That's forty seven cents more than the week before. Meanwhile, it took an average one hundred and seventeen dollars forty one cents Jamaican to purchase one Canadian dollar. One British pound cost on average one hundred and ninety nine dollars ninety three cents Jamaican, and you could buy one euro for one hundred and seventy two dollars ten cents Jamaican on average. Finally, on the crypto markets, Bitcoin prices were up ten percent over the past five days, trading at forty eight thousand seven hundred and sixty six dollars US on Monday. Ethereum prices rose slightly, trading at two thousand five hundred and twenty five dollars US on Monday. Disclaimer. This is not intended as financial advice. Please consult a licensed financial advisor before making investment decisions. Welcome back. So before we introduce the analyst, Shelly Ann wanted me to explain what was Warner Media, please, because not everybody follows all the news. Well, we did mention it in um in what's hot in business, but I just wanted to share this as well from Money Mission, like I was telling you. We had this person who attended Build Your Budget, which was in person, and she said, in November, a good friend of mine approached me about joining Warner Media. Let me zoom in, make this bigger so you guys can read what she said. In November, a good friend of mine approached me about joining Warner Media. I was doubtful, and he showed me his earnings that got me interested, but I didn't have the money as I made plans for Christmas. He told me about levels and I was a bit suspicious, but it was someone I knew. In January, I went to build your budget. The team said, Jody, this sounds very risky, like another cash plus scheme. Be careful. But he was my friend and I was willing to risk it. Two weeks later, Warner Media crashed. He lost over a million dollars and is so stressed. Long story short, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Thanks, Money Mission, for keeping me in check. And trust me, the amount of people who lost a lot of money, the amount of people who borrowed money to invest in Warner Media, and the way it was structured, they said that you would get paid to watch videos. So basically, they claimed to work for artists and companies that wanted to boost the views on their YouTube pages so that they have big numbers. So they would get like a lot of people to just go and watch videos and they would pay you to watch the videos. But the kicker is that you have to pay an upfront fee to join and they call this your initial investment, right? And so people would pay this fee and they have to get to different levels of the pyramid, which they probably weren't calling it a pyramid. I'm calling, I'm calling it a pyramid now, but you pay this fee and then the more people who come onto your team you earn money. So your general, your basic uh, pyramid scheme type of structure. So that's what happened to this particular member. I'm very happy that she didn't go ahead with it. And I just want to show you as well, for those who are Money Mission members who are asking about the TAJ webinar, just log into your account, scroll here to the Entrepreneurs tab. And here is where you'll find your replay. How to file your taxes. This was the event with Courtney Johnson from TAJ last night. And as you will see here, we also have 
you know, whenever I see opportunities, I post them right here. Opportunities to win money or cash or grants for your business. Anyway, let's get back to our show. It's time now for the analysts. And I'm joined by business writer at the Jamaica Observer, David Rose, and Julian Morrison, founder of Wealth Watch JA. Welcome back, David and Julian. Hi, Kalila. So, David, I am going to start with you this evening. Today, we're talking about Massey and who they were on just last week. Massey has changed its senior officers and directors, the president and the group CEO. So high level changes going on at Massey. And as you heard last week, this is a major company around the Caribbean. So what's going on? Why these big changes, David? So, you know, we would have heard about Massey holding its 100th annual general meeting back in December. And, you know, one of the senior executives, you know, raising concerns about one of the training programs they have. And, you know, we saw in the Trinidad Guardian, you know, they spoke to Jervis, whose his whole name is Elliot Jervis Warder. Uh, no relation to what is being discussed before with the segment. And, you know, he said that, you know, his decision to retire early, you know, is meant to avoid a distraction based on what was discussed or brought forward at the AGM. So, you know, Jervis would have been leading Massey going back to 2009. You know, he'd have taken the reins as official CEO at the end of 2009 after the passing of the former CEO. You know, I believe, I believe it's Mr. Whiteaway. And, you know, he would have been leading for the last 14 years, well, last 13 years, this transformation in Massey in terms of where it was just this massive sprawling Caribbean conglomerate in so many areas into this focused uh, Caribbean heart focused business with three distinct portfolios. So you know it would have been interesting if you retired you know just on the normal times and you know you retain me as a director you know that is one thing but you know to just see that the meeting was back on December 18 and less than two months later, and he's retiring, you know, was pretty surprising because this, you know, gentleman, you know, was expected to retire until next year. So the one year early retirement kind of caught people off guard. But you would have heard about AJ in a Kalila. So, mm -hmm. but so, in an other, go ahead, Kalila. Right. So, is it odd for this change to take place? Because, you know, the CEO, it was, retirement level so he's up there in age something that we should expect i think as people always say it's not necessarily you know when you leap a role it's under the circumstances so had jervis said hey i wanted to retire and we didn't have the backdrop of what occurred in december it had not been as surprising in a sense to see the retirement you know, we saw it last year where there were several other, you know, departures at different organizations of CEOs. So when they did a move from one CEO to the other, you know, from financial services to food, others, you know, uh, resigned, you know, amidst, you know, majority shareholders, you know, in, I should say, a preference for a different leader. So, you know, We've, so we've seen a lot of changes in the last year in terms of senior leaders. And I was reading an article, maybe it was on Bloomberg or on Economist, where they were saying that, you know, we have seen a number of, you know, significant leadership changes in the last year in the in the more advanced markets, basically the US markets. But at that point, something just the way the retirement occurred. You know, I really respect Jervis, you know, in, you know, intervening for the last two years for different stories and you know it's been good to see you know the work that he's led alongside the team for the company because Massey you know we're just known as this Trinidadian conglomerate you know just in telecommunications insurance real estate this that supermarket slim down and it, yeah, slim, I remember Massey is the one that actually started high low well started but I believe the ones who had a high low before they sold to the 1990s in Jamaica to Grace and you know they only rebranded the high-low brands in the region to massive stores like when they didn't rebrand in other day. So, you know, he's been massive since 2004, you know, 
retiring now, 20 years stint, you know, with the company is pretty interesting, but as I say, this is circumstances. Mm -hmm. But in other news, you know, we saw whereby Massey's acquisition of IGL in Jamaica has significantly added to the top and bottom line. So for those who don't know, last year around August, Massey would have acquired IGL Limited, which is a gas production company that's based here in Jamaica. And, you know, Massey already had their gas production business with Massey Gas Products. So, you know, they have a quite the market share and presence in Jamaica. And in their first quarter, their revenue went up by 100 and, sorry, revenue went up by 63% to TT 301.98 million dollars, which is about 6.79 billion Jamaican dollars to translate it into our dollars and cents. And before tax, it went by 121% so 35.25 million TT, which is about 793 million Jamaican dollars. So it effectively doubled from last year to this year, just from the addition of IGL. So prior to the IGL acquisition, Massey's only presence in Jamaica would have been through Massey Distribution Jamaica and through Massey Gas Products. Just with the inclusion of IGL, we've seen a significant jump in you know, the profitability of the business. And they're looking to further extract synergies across the Caribbean through their gas products platform, through the production of oxygen and other necessary products, you know, for the regions, you know, viability and, and growth. So we are seeing, you know, where the masses acquisition of last year are really paying off. Even on the top line level, they're able to grow revenue by 18% to 4.02 billion TT. You know, we'd have seen some leveling off in the bottom line. They highlighted that, you know, the, there are some one-off events and you know, they would have been impacted to an extent in terms of business slowdown because of the Venezuela Guyana situation that has been, you know, in the spotlight in recent times. So all in all, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what's the step forward, you know, following Jerry's retirement on April 6th, which is actually his birthday, as he hands mm -hmm. over to David Afonso, who you know has been with Massey for more than 30 years. So <laughs> I'm just looking forward to see what they plan to do because are they special intents to actually use our capital markets to further propel them to their global ambitions across you know, the world and jamaica is a critical element towards that growth plan interesting but so going back to the change in in leadership do you think this is a fallout from the whole obia thing that was in the news the other day i i never said that word you know i never said that word but I'm, that's why i'm asking that Mentioned that they said that they said it, you know, the interview with Jervis is what company sources and they said that they didn't want to be a distraction, you know, amidst, you know, their overarching activities as a business. So, you know, I'm not going to say it's a follow up, but, you know, it's likely the accelerant to the fire for this decision, basically, to put it into a more relatable way. Because, realistically speaking, I don't know what's going on in that program. You know, Miss Angelique Paris at Puerto Rico described what she had interpreted, but I'm not going to call it something when I've never been in that session. So I'm just going to, you know, earn a side of caution at the angle. Mm -hmm. Boy, the memes were <laughs> the memes were hilarious coming out of Trinidad. The, the oh, Twitter yeah. memes were hilarious. The TikToks as well, like so, Trinidad Twitter is very fun. Uh, and I'm sorry, we're not ever carnival, but another day in the future. Oh yeah, it's today now. Carnival is today, cause tomorrow. Yesterday tomorrow. and today, Kalila. Yeah. It's a holiday. Nobody, nobody just works. It's just straight carnival. A big carnival in Trinidad today. Hey, hey. Well, Julian, you are going to tell us all about Meta this year. You always bring the heat with the international stock picks, and today you're looking at Meta's full year for 2023. How did they do? Good night, everyone. So Meta formerly known as Facebook, has had a very strong financial year in the 2023. So the company has grown its net profit after tax by 68.5% to 39.1 billion. And this has a lot to do with core growth in revenues of 15.7%. And beneath that, there is an increase in daily active users of about 8% to 3.2 billion users. So for context, the company owns Instagram, WhatsApp, 
on Facebook and the lion's share of the revenues from all these platforms come from advertising. And of course, the sale of data to, to third parties. Additionally, which um, the factor which supported growth in net profit after tax is an improvement in cost to income, which fell by about 70 basis points, um, which, is, which is significant. Now the company over the last three financial years invested $92.3 billion, and all these figures are in US, in share buybacks, which would give the shares an upward bias because what that does is take supply out of the market. So if a company is growing net profit after tax or earnings year over year over year, and there are less shares available on the market, it actually gives the stock upside because the supply of the stock is falling. So even if demand remains constant, it gives the stock an upward bias. Now, the company also invested 77.4 billion US in fixed assets. So that actually grows the operating capacity and this excludes acquisition of other companies. And additionally, just to show the funding sustainability of the business, it generated 180 billion US over the same three year period in operating cash flows. So this limits the need for borrowing. So because the operating cash is sustainable and it's much larger than expenditure, it means that the company has several options that it can explore, whether by growth in core projects by means of increasing its capacity in research and development or buying back shares or acquiring other businesses. Now, what's interesting is that Meta has paid its first dividend ever of $1.1 billion in cash to its class A shareholders yesterday. And that produced some upside recently. So the stock is now trading very richly. It is actually up 2.7 times above its 52 week low, but it is down 5.3% from the 52 week high. Still, mm -hmm. the stock is up 24% from the 50 day moving average and up 47% from the 200 day moving average. So it's a stock that is on the move even though it is on, um, it is just below the high, the 52 week high. In terms of the valuation, it's trading at 31.5 times in terms of the PE, but the forward PE is expected to be 23 times. So that's significant. So the company is expected to grow earnings sustainably and bring down the PE in terms of the valuation. The return on equity is 28%, which is very high, but even though the company is doing well from a return on equity standpoint, i.e. It's performing well in terms of productivity. I still believe that the stock is trading richly. Um, a more fair price probably would have been about $300. Right now, it is trading in the $400 range at $460. And that $300 would bring it closer to a 20 times PE. But of course, all of these significant developments around the company would bring a lot more momentum to the stock. I think that a cheaper area to look at is probably energy, probably like an Exxon Mobil, because technology itself as a space um, is carrying a very high valuation. The NVIDIAs of the world, the Microsofts of the world. So energy is a good area to look at for cheapness and potential upside, not just from the price, because energy prices are likely to rise, in my opinion, in the next 12 months because of what's going on with shipping rates. And additionally, these companies that have more experience. Right. What's, like, what's going on with shipping rates? What did I miss right. there? So shipping rates are likely to rise because of what's happening in the Panama Canal. And of course, the Houthi rebels have been attacking a lot of vessels in the Red Sea corridor. So what that does is that it forces vessels to reroute, which increases how much energy ships have to spend to deliver the same goods to the same destinations. And, and also, what's happening in Panama Canal? I feel like I'm behind. What's going on? So there is actually drought conditions in the Panama Canal, which oh. reduces the number of ships that can go through the canal and the volume, not just the number of ships, but the size of the ships. Because the shallower the water becomes, is the, the, the smaller the vessels have to be to pass through it because larger vessels require deeper water. And because of the prolonged drought, the water level has fallen significantly over the last 18 months. So shipping delays 
um, create upside in energy prices and also there are other factors like geopolitical tensions so we're noticing the ongoing conflict between russia and ukraine and of course the heating the heating conflict between gaza and israel we anticipate these factors to drive up energy prices because more arab nations are coming to um, gaza's um, assistance um, in the midst of the attacks by israel but <laughs> I, I watch geopolitics. I think geopolitics and energy go hand in hand. So persons who have that kind of interest and orientation can look at energy. I think energy is underpriced and I think tech is overpriced as a group. So those are two domains you can look at. And you notice that Saudi Arabia and UAE just joined BRICS? I think BRICS is here to stay. Listen. Yes, Iran as well, so Iran, Saudi Arabia, UAE, along with Egypt and Ethiopia, but those three in specifically major oil producers. Yes, yeah, so to not bore the to not bore the the viewers, Iran is a sworn enemy of the US. So their beef, their beef for the US like bloods and cooks, they'll never they'll never get a lot. Um, another way of looking at it is like PNP and JLP. Don't ever expect Iran to to side with the US. So what you find is that. The enemies of the U.S. are seemingly forming tighter political and economic mm -hmm. ties in order to, to, to change globalization. So in the last 20 years, globalization was, feature, was featured a lot of U.S. companies um, using cheap manufacturing resource bases to, to, to produce goods cheaply to sell back to um, high-income countries. We're seeing that change significantly because we're seeing the formation of no more localized and region-based trading blocks and political alliances. So, for example, what would have happened with EU is likely to become more prominent, but it will be more region-specific. So we're seeing more fragmented trade. We're moving away from the era of having broad-based globalization that we all have become used to. And this is also inflationary because it goes against economies of scale, but it also produces opportunities. So if if the, all these territories are not necessarily using old trade routes, then they'll have to focus more locally and it will create more local opportunities. So for example, chip manufacturing, more of that will happen on US shores for argument's sake. That is a boom for the US economy because more production will happen in the US and boost the manufacturing sector in the US. And that could have knock-on effects for the Caribbean region being neighbors. So there is upside in it, but overall we expect that to be inflationary, especially within the context of energy, because all these things take energy and energy is finite or it is a finite resource. So even if even if we have the same amount of, of oil refineries, the more exhausted oil becomes and the further away the oil gets from the surface is the more expensive it gets to, to, to refine and produce. And it means that the cost of oil goes up as it becomes more and more exhausted. So- well, what about having another major oil producer in our region in the mix, which is Guyana? Yes, that's, that's good. That's, that's good within the context of Guyana seeing super normal growth because they are now comparing having, for example, five distribution points to having two distribution points in a prior period. So that would show growth of multiples and multiples in terms, in terms of GDP. And what that will do is modernize Guyana somewhat in some contexts, we'll see a boom in, in, in services being offered, a boom in GDP per capita. So it means that the citizens in Guyana would have more wallet share to actually demand new types of products and services. So Jamaican firms, Trinidadian firms, some Guyanese firms would benefit from this. However, in terms of the oil story, Guyana being on stream is not enough to change the globalized issue of oil running out. Um, I'm an energy bull, but a lot of what I'm saying is, is medium term. So this has to do with the next five to seven years, we should see a spike in energy prices because energy demand is not going to fall as much as we think. So even though there's a transition to green energy, um, a lot of the systems that it take that 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 are required to transition to green energy 
takes fossil fuels to actually enact. So for example, talk about EVs and trying to produce more EVs, getting more EVs on the road. You actually need fossil fuels to produce EVs. And even if we do transition to green energy, we still have not figured out how to get green energy to be as productive as fossil fuels because we built an entire economy or several economies across the world on fossil fuels. So green energy will only be able to do so much and no more. Um, there's a podcast called Macro Voices. You can check it out. It actually speaks about this in far more detail. Um, I think it's a credible source um, in terms of the, the, the bull case for oil. Sean has a question. So does that translate to RPL and FESCO benefiting from this? Um, I guess so. I mean, there, it would be a bull case for RPL and, and, um, and FESCO, but the, I think that the most upside is from the standpoint of production. So what you find is that companies that control the entire value chain, like Exxon Mobil, they are mining the oil, they're refining it, they're producing it, they're distributing it, they have better margins. FESCO's margins are very small. Um, it's less than 5%. So, I mean, I guess there's a case for it, but the real game for FESCO is scale. So they need to build out as many distribution points as possible. And that's capital intensive. Um, so I'm not against that. I think we can make more money, but I just think that there's much bigger opportunity looking at companies that control a wider span of the value chain, as opposed to just a distributor with like a 3% margin. And you have to deploy all this capital just to increase your volume. It just doesn't work out for income first, opportunity cost. Wow. Uh, Thanks so much for the heads up. Just, you had something. Who's that, David? Yeah, just one thing to add. Uh, so one thing that we should also remember, as Julian mentioned, you know, is that because of the Russia-Ukraine crisis, we saw initial spike in prices then, and then with the price cap that we're seeing by, you know, the G7 countries, you know, you've seen so much retreat in prices because Russian oil is still making its way to the rest of the world. But at the same time, you're, we are seeing other situations that we need to remember. For one, Venezuela is not producing the same amount of capacity in terms of oil. Iran is under the sanctions. So there are different cases or triggers that can increase or decrease prices because if there was Russian, Iranian, and Venezuelan oil right now, prices are probably a lot cheaper than they are right now. So the geopolitics that Julian highlighted is a very critical element, you know, towards that whole will who will benefit in terms of the consumer and everything else regarding the price of energy. And then we, you know, even a FESCO, as Julian pointed out, they are a marketing company for the most part. While they can, you know, supply dealer owned, dealer operated gas stations. They're still going to be, you know, hitting small margins and relying heavily on that increased volume consumption from Jamaica becoming a more developed economy to really scale further. And then re-meta, one thing to also remember is that I remember somebody sharing that picture about how meta was as low as $8 back in, I think, late 2022, when the price crashed and everything. It's $18 and we just had $470 just this week. So... It's just pretty interesting to see that at one point in time, the company was dragged by the market, you know, did its stuff, could tend to do a buyback now, the credit price dividend, and the price has just gone to the moon. So, you know, the US market always gives you know, some insights and lessons that you just tend to appreciate because the funny thing is, almost one every two persons on the planet uses some meta products at this point Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook. And the reality is <laughs> the world is still getting more and more connected in a sense. So their growth is still pretty high. And with all that cash they have on their hands, they can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So those are just my two cents. All right. Thanks, David. Thanks, Julian. Great insights this week. Guys, You're welcome. Pay, attention. pay attention. Oil prices, something to watch. We're going to take a break, our final break. I'll come back with some comments. I want to read. You guys have some interesting comments this week. We'll be right back.
All right, let's take a final comments. Javon says, good night. Remember not to sleep on Dolphin Cove. Do your research. What do you know, Javon? Uh, he also says, while it's important to invest, it's also important to have cash on hand. So savings or dry powder is a part of wealth building as you'll be able to quickly grasp good opportunities. Lanestra says, wondering if it was that company. So talking about Warner Media now. A lot of comments on Warner Media. Wondering if it was that company in my family that hardly ever call me was telling me about. So they never call you. All of a sudden, they call out the blue telling you to sign up for, War <laughs> for Warner Media. Uriel says, the first thing I look at is the interest rate. If it's ridiculous, then I ignore it. Well, it's not even interest. They were paying out. So they presented it as a job, like a side hustle, a legitimate thing that you actually work by watching these videos and they pay you for your work, but there's levels to the work and you still need to recruit people to come onto your team. Shelly Ann said, I make money with cash plus, but you only invest what you're willing to lose. The people who joined late, they lose, that's how it go. <laughs> that's what always happens. In the beginning, you make money and then as it dwindles down, you get let me not say the word. You get catch, put it that way. Andre says, I'm guessing regulation would be the best choice to stop Ponzi schemes. Any type of banking should have an oversight committee or board. It wasn't banking. And then regulation, you have to catch them. But then it was so popular that maybe it should have caught the eye of the regulators sooner. FSC did put out a statement today, but we don't know at what point they became familiar with Warner Media, if it caught their attention, if anybody reported it to them before, uh, probably not because people were making money from it, but they were not registered with the FSC. However, like I said, they did not position themselves as an investment company. They positioned themselves as a business that you can be employed to. So I don't know if it would have come under the purview of the FSC anyway. Uh, Jason says, I really needed this TAJ tutorial. Can't believe I missed it. Jason, it's still available. Go to moneymissionja.com and go to the Entrepreneurs tab and you can watch the replay. Shelly Ann says, you must be willing to lose what you bet with quickly. <laughs> Mr. Brown says, we can't all be winners. Must have some suckers. Ryan says, people need to be knowledgeable of legally administrated companies and stop following overnight schemes. Quick money is not the way to wealth. Here's the thing. If it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Apparently, this company has been operating since 2019, so it's been around for a while. And they were registered at the company's office, but they only registered in September last year. So operating below the radar up until September last year, very recently. And apparently they were also doing charity work, donating to schools and presenting themselves as a legitimate company. Devin says Ponzi scheme can't be stopped because people don't read and they like quick returns, which is why I saw the red flag immediately. From the minute she described it, I was like, this song is scammish. Shelly Ann, okay, we already answered that question. Sean says the returns on investment from Warner Media was too insane for me to actually take it seriously. First red flag, if the, if the return is too insane, yep. Uh, Sean says, had two family members that approached me about investing in Warner Media, but after they told me that I had to pay them and give a reference, I knew it was already a pyramid scheme. Antoinette reminding you guys to like up the press the like button. At the time she posted, she said only 50 likes so far. So like the video, guys. Shelly Ann, again, at least with Cash Plus, you weren't taking on another job to recruit. You invest one or two times, then sit and wait on your monthly interest. So this is the difference between a Ponzi scheme and a pyramid scheme. So the Ponzi scheme is an investment named for, what's his name? His last name was actually Ponzi, the person who for whom Ponzi scheme is named. I forget the first name. But you invest with this investment firm that presents itself as a legitimate investment and you sit on and collect, you let your money grow. And the way that they fund the very high returns that they give you is simply by recruiting more people to the scheme. You as the customer don't do the recruiting though. Maybe you refer somebody, but there's no work involved. A pyramid scheme, on the other hand, has layers to it. So it usually depends heavily 
on the recruitment of it. And then those at the top of the pyramid are the people who make the most money, which is what, which is how I would describe the structure of Warner Media. Shellyann says, if you have to recruit people under you, red flag. Roswell says, simple-minded people get scammed. Why pay fees for a service that promises me income or money? <laughs> yep. So apparently in the beginning, Warner Media was free. You didn't have to pay any fees. And then later on, they added this fee thing because they said that people weren't doing the work. And so it was supposed to be your commitment to doing the job and basically earn it back through the income that you make. But yeah, if you're signing up for a job, why do I have to pay you to hire me? Mm -hmm. That's suspicious. Dravé says, I got scammed from Ponzi schemes in 2016. Didn't wise up and got scammed again in 2017. Wise up from there on. Good job, Dravé. Fool me one, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Wise up after that. Eric says, I just love this program. Thank you, Eric. OG says, almost everything in our homes is made from oil, fossil fuel. Brother is dead right. You heard the warning. Oil prices are likely to go up later this year. And then we have Brother Adam who says, Fesco stations look, what's that, fresher than many competitors, but we need more ATMs at service station areas again, please. And more food choices as well though Ochi is getting a new chicken place. Nice. All right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in once again, for tuning in this week, as you always do. I appreciate your presence. I appreciate your comments. Make sure that you like the video, subscribe to the channel, share this video with a friend, subscribe to the newsletter at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter so you don't miss what's coming up. We have a lot going on on Thursday. My new program with Remax Elite Realty is going to premiere right here on this platform and on Remax's channel as well. It's called The Property Source, brought to you or powered by Remax Elite Realty. It is a video podcast all about real estate. We have some really interesting topics coming up. We filmed the first six episodes already. They're going to be airing every other week on a Thursday. So Thursday at 8 o'clock. It's appointment watching right here on YouTube again for the property source powered by Remax Elite. Now follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Kalila Ray. And remember, that's my only account. I have no backup accounts. So please report any scammers and impersonators whenever you see them. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. And you can also visit kalilareynolds.com for financial information you can use however you like it. Watch, listen, or read. We post summaries of these episodes on the website. We also have the podcast version on Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora, uh, whichever podcast platform you prefer. Now tell a friend about taking stock because investing is the new sexy. So let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Thanks for watching and see you next week. Let's get this money. <laughs> <laughs>